Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us this evening for our parent and guardian or, um, orientation for our transition back to full in-person learning at the Harold L. Qualters Middle School. I'm super excited that we've finally gotten back to this point. I feel like I've been waiting for this since April 5th of 2020. Um, with, uh, with me tonight in the background, super uh, big thanks to my amazing assistant principals, Ms. Catilla and Mr. Hoffman, and also Dr. Abrams, who's joined us, our assistant director of special education. Uh, depending on what comes up, they're here to provide the support that we need in the background, although you can't see them. I'd like to talk a little bit about how we're gonna manage any questions that people may have over the course of this presentation. On every slide but one, <laughs> and I'll explain why when I get to that slide, you'll see mostly in the bottom left-hand corner, the word questions followed by a, uh, a shortened URL. That URL is bit.ly backslash QMSFIPL, and that's QMS Full In-Person Learning. By using that link, you'll be taken to a form where you can submit questions. Ms. Cotillo, Mr. Hoffman, and Dr. Abrams are monitoring those questions throughout and will be shuttling them to me <laughs> through a back channel um, at the end. We've gone to this method for questions primarily um, because oftentimes with public chats, we've had people ask some pretty private questions about their own child, and we want to make sure that we have a much more confidential venue um, for those questions to come in to, to make it so that nobody feels any pressure to be sharing private information about their own children. We'll also be sending out a frequently asked questions document based on those materials, and we'll obviously reach out if there's some student-specific stuff that comes in. Um, so again, that web address, you don't have to write it down. Um, it's on every slide but one, um, and it's bit.ly backslash, then in all caps, Q-M-S-F-I-P-L. So with all that said, we're gonna get started, and I'd like to thank everybody for joining us here this evening as we begin this presentation about our return to full in-person learning, which again, as a reminder, will be on April 5th. Um, what this means is that all of our current hybrid students will move to full in-person classes. Hybrid currently is what, we, what I have referred to as the school-based model. Um, the model that the majority of the students are following. For students who are on the red and navy team, there will be no changes. Nothing at all will change. April 5th will come and it will look just like April 2nd. Um, so, so don't have any worries or concerns about that. Um, the big piece is why are we making this shift? Well, and there's two primary reasons. First is at the Qualters Middle School, we are looking to implement what we have learned is the strongest instructional model, and that's in-person learning. I know that the Commissioner of Education and other people have talked about the strain that hybrid and remote learning have had on adolescent students. And this is, the cause for this goes well beyond simply just whether or not somebody's in a school building. This is also about the type of instruction that our students receive and the level of attention that a teacher can give to every student in their classroom, and the types of activities that we can do when we're not as connected to the computer all the time. Computers definitely have a, a role in education, and they can be leveraged for some amazing opportunities, um, but, but when they're at the center of everything we do, that can, that can truly wear on, on, on everybody. So we're committed to bringing QMS back to what we have seen as the strongest instructional model, applying the positive lessons we've learned, but to that strongest instructional model. Secondly, there have now been a multitude of studies that have shown um, very little or almost no difference in COVID transmission in schools with three foot distancing and other mitigating measures. Um, this concept of other mitigating measures is really the central point of tonight's presentation um, because it, without those we won't have the success that we should be able to predict and this really is just reinforcing a lot of things we've been doing since the first day um, but it is important to make sure that we're all on the same page before i change the slide i'll take a moment to point out to everybody that the questions link is still on the bottom of the page um, but I am pointing that out because I believe the next slide is the one where I took it off, and I'll explain why in a moment. 
in talking with Mr. Naraco and Ms. Sankey, um, I've learned that the uh, most popular question everybody faced has been about buses. So I wanted to put this slide here. Now this image is found on the school's webpage as well as the district's webpage. And um, although you can't click on the hyperlink here, you can click on it on those places. And um, if you're seeking to add transportation um, for your child and they do not have it yet at this point, please go to that link. Um, if you have specific questions about transportation in the buses, there's contact information um, down on the bottom of that, that page. If your child is currently taking the bus, they will still be taking the bus. This is for people who are not currently doing that. Um, buses still require assigned seats. Um, they can put a, a two students per seat, but they have to be masked, obviously, and um, the windows uh, have to be open at certain intervals and spacing. So again, if there's any questions about the buses, the information's there. Don't feel that you have to write down that really long web address um, because it is available on both the schools and the district's website. And the reason I don't have my questions <laughs> link on this page is simply that um, for bus questions, you really need to direct it to our transportation office. And there's some amazing people there who'll be happy to help you. Now I'd like to go ahead um, and start talking about the mitigating measures, many of which we've had in place and some of which we're either adjusting or implementing now based on recent guidance we've received from the Department of Education and from lessons we've learned over the course of the year. Again, just to reiterate that that link is still at the bottom for people who need it. The team, for lack of a better term, is the most important mitigating measure. Um, I shared this graphic earlier in my original presentation and it still holds true today. Our success will be driven by the commitment to our efforts by Mansfield at large. Today, Ms. Cotillo, Mr. Hoffman and myself each met with students who are currently in the hybrid model to go over a similar presentation, but one that was a little bit more tailored to them to talk about our expectations for them um, in this model and to talk about how their buy-in and participation um, in these mitigating measures is crucial to the support that we have. Our faculty and staff has been working tirelessly to prepare the building to make sure that they understand the routines and practices we have in place and how to manage them. And they're also getting really excited to get back to a, um, a form of classroom education that's much more suited to the middle level student. Part of our success does depend on the, the community at large, Mansfield and the surrounding areas. Um, obviously avoiding those large scale events that can spread COVID-19, making sure that um, our, our community continues to um, you know, actively comply with masking guidelines and other requirements that are out there to maintain a healthy community. We rely on our parents and guardians. You, it's one of the reasons why I really hope lots of people were able to join us tonight because it's important that we're on the same page, that when we're having to have conversations with people, students about not engaging appropriately with the mitigating measures we have in place, that we have your support and, um, and backing when we do so because it's important that we have those in place. And it's important that you equally support our efforts as does the faculty and staff and the student body. So let's hit the, la the laundry list of, of measures. So six foot distancing is not going away. Um, there are just places where three feet will, will be um, usable within the school environment. Um, this is gonna become incredibly important where there's less structure. Um, so those of that, you'll see some examples that, of that as we come in, but places where there's not a seating chart, if there's places where students are seated for a period of time and there's no seating chart, it's six feet. Um, flat out. Anytime a student has a mask off for either a mask break or for uh, eating a meal, it's got to be six feet. Um, that's non-negotiable. When students are in line in the cafeteria, they've got to stay six feet apart because we don't have like a seating chart of the line and, and for lunch. Um, so we'll have all of that in place um, so that we can um, 
make sure that our students keep that. If they're waiting to get into a classroom, we still have six foot distancing mar markers. So six foot is still a thing, for uh, a big thing. Um, we will have three foot distancing in most of our classrooms. Whenever it can be more, it will be more, but we will have at least that three foot minimum um, within our classroom seat to seat. And our classrooms are structured so that the desks or tables are all facing the same way. Um, this is in line with guidance that we've received from the Department of Education. Um, and it also is in line with um, the information shared by the Center for, Centers for Disease Control. Um, so we will have that three foot distancing in place, but we also have seating charts in all of those places so that if we ever did have to do contact tracing, we would have a record on file of who is where. Um, we're continuing with our masks. Obviously, there's no change in this. Still asking for two layers or more, still asking for no vents. Really has not been an issue for us. Um, we always tell the students, and I reiterated it to them today because sometimes they get to school and uh, you know, a panicked student will come up to me, I forgot my mask, Mr. McGovern, what do I do? And just let somebody know, we'll get them a mask. We have extras around, um, so, so we're always prepared for that. Proper ventilation, uh, this is something that's on the district, but we've really um, done some uh, amazing work. I can't thank um, our facilities department, in particular our HVAC technician for all the work that they've done, changing filters, getting the highest rated filter they can for each unit, um, just making sure that everything's clean, having audits done, all of that, like doing everything we can to make sure our ventilation's up to, to, um, to the times. Additionally with that, um, we'll also talk, I, I'd like to also point out that over the course of the winter, and this probably won't be as much of an issue going forward, but um, you know, students have mentioned it's a little bit colder, and that's because we've been pulling in significantly more um, outdoor air than we would have in a normal heating season um, to keep up that proper ventilation. Rigorous contact tracing, um, when or if we do have instances of COVID-19 is gonna be a crucial, crucial part of our program. As long as regularly hand, uh, children and students and adults and staff and everybody regularly using hand sanitizer, which is readily available throughout every room um, in the school, as well as washing hands um, and, and to, to, to keep clean. We're maintaining with our platooning, keeping students um, in a, a less, a, a, a more narrow defined group of students throughout the day um, to reduce any possible spread that could occur. Um, we have not seen in QMS um, spread of COVID between students all year long. So that's a positive thing. And I think we're going to continue with that. But, you know, there's no guarantees in life. Um, but we are going to continue to keep that platooning model to minimize any exposure that would ever happen within the building. Obviously, the cooperation and support from all stakeholders is always a crucial step here. Student laboratory use, this is something that the um, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education gave us a little bit more guidance on, um, you know, to keep it closed during passing to make sure that there's no congregating in there. Um, students will continue to sign out using a digital sign out sheet so that they can access from their own Chromebooks. Um, and the rule is if they go in and there's no open toilet, then the bathroom's full. So um, that actually works because we had to close down some toilets to maintain distancing. Um, so the numbers all, all line up that way. And obviously prompting students to wash their hands. Quarantining close contacts. Um, one question many parents have already asked me about are passing in the hallways. So we have these passing plans um, that are documents that show how each platoon moves from class to class. Um, and it, it's kind of done in a very organized manner. Um, every period, one teacher has their prep. So the first class to change would be the one going to the kids who have the prep, who the, the class that had the prep. Um, so that's going to be um, kind of one way that we do it. And then additionally, then the next class moves, the next class moves. It, it is only five or six classes, and they're all really close to each other. It happens super quick. Additionally, whenever kids can not go in the hallway to change classes and use those fire doors between the classrooms, we use that. Um, right now, when I stand in the hallway during passing, it really is hard to tell that it happened. Um, it'll probably be a little bit more obvious when all the students are back, but we are confident with that. Uh, we're going to have to be maintaining our assigned seating in the cafeteria. Uh, I'll talk more about lunch later, but we're going to maintain that assigned seating. But as uh, teams are working with students to get a little bit more student voice in who's sitting where um, as we um, move forward to April 5th. 
And this is a big one I could ask for some, some support with. Um, our technology department, our food service department, and my office assistants went through a lot of heroic work to get barcoded uh, student identifications to be two things, library cards, and also um, the card that they use to swipe or scan actually when they get their breakfast or lunch. Um, this is something that seems to be falling away and it really does slow down the line. Um, and it also results in kind of more interaction uh, between the cafeteria staff and the students. So anything that parents could do just to, you know, prompt their kids to make sure that they have those IDs. If they've lost their IDs, they can see Ms. Hazel or Ms. Spivak in the main office and we can get them um, replacements. It's not a big deal, um, but that's gonna be an important piece as well, not only for a mitigating measure, but also to keep the, the lunch line and the breakfast line moving. So how about the student day as we move to this new format? So um, how does the student day change? Uh, for Red and Navy, I'm just gonna reiterate, nothing changes. April 5th will look like April 2nd. And um, I know that um, the Red and Navy teachers are, are ready and, and willing to and able to go forward with that, that remote instruction. So there's no change going on there. Um, we are, completely maxed out on our capacity um, in the cafeteria slash auditorium right now with half the kids. We don't really have another space to add on. So our solution for meals is to have more of them as opposed to um, expand space like they've been able to do in some other schools. So we're gonna, have, we're gonna continue in school breakfast for the rest of the year. Um, we will have five of them. Um, and we will also have five lunches a day. Um, each lunch right now is, or breakfast is by grade right now, and it's going to shift to being by a uh, team, and there will be two teams for each meal um, when they come down to the cafeteria slash auditorium. I'll show you a snippet of the bell schedule later on, but more importantly, uh, teachers are going to go over those bell schedules with the students as we get closer to April 5th. We're no longer going to be live streaming classes um, because we're going to reiterate our full commitment to that proven instructional model with our full in-person learning. Um, I will talk about how we're going to handle students who may have to quarantine later on, but you know, for normal day-to-day uh, -day illnesses or, or doctor's appointments or things like that, um, we're going to go back to handling those the way we always have, um, where you know you dismiss your child or you know if you choose to keep your child home for the day, you know, it's a day out of school and, and we'll work to get back on track. Um, but again, that really comes down to that full commitment to that proven instructional, more interactive class model um, that we know is gonna provide a, a better foundation for our students to be learning. Um, we will be starting limited after school activity on April 27th. I'll also talk about that a little bit more. Um, but wanted to put that out there because that's something to this point we've really um, not been able to do. There's not a ton of changes to the start of the school day, um, but I do want to go over some key points. Um, we'll continue to open doors and students will continue to use the same entrances they have. Um, starting, at, we'll be opening the doors at 7.15 a.m. Um, teams continue to use the specified entrances. We spent a lot of today and well in the future of coaching students to not bunch up at the doorway and to, again, distance themselves appropriately outside. Around each of those doorways, there's plenty of space and um, there's not a, t a, a real heavy amount of students at most of the doorways until the bus is let out and the bus is let out right before the doors open. Um, it's a little bit different for the purple and blue teams. They really got to spread out on the grass only because they get off the bus and they're they're right at their door the second they step off the bus. Um, so we'll be working with those, those teams in particular, but all teams to do that. We, the big part of the defined doorway is to just all, it's not only to spread the students out, but they are placed in a way that facilitates a one-way traffic flow in different parts of the building. So it is really important that people are using the proper entrance. After 7.25 AM, um, that's when classes start. I have paraprofessionals who are at those doorways, um, you know, keeping them secure. <laughs> um, while the students are in, they have to, they have to get to class. 
Um, so at that point, students coming out after 725 would need to come to the main entrance and check in with Ms. Presentado. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this later. Uh, drop off the street lot has been an ongoing um, situation that we need some improvement upon. And I'll talk about that a little bit further with another slide. This slide's just showing to everybody again where um, each team enters and um, it's no different than it was at the beginning of the year. Um, this is the big slide that I really is something that I need to talk to parents and guardians about. It's, it's not really a student issue. And this has to do with traffic flow on East Street. Um, we really, especially when we're bringing double the number of students into the building, need parents and guardians to drop off where the green is, even if they're going to a different door than that that's close to the green. Just like, unfortunately, some of our students on buses have to walk a little bit of a distance, we need to ask some of our drop-offs to do. Obviously, individual situations we can we can kind of work with, but um, what happens is once pe once one person lets out a student where that red bar is, the traffic is backing up on E Street. And um, the traffic there is pretty bad to begin with. So even if you're stopped there, we ask that you not drop off till you pull up to where the green bar is. We're working on some improved signage, um, but but this is, this is really important to the traffic flow. Um, Assistant Superintendent Donahue has worked closely with the Mansfield uh, Police Department and state agencies in terms of tra traffic flow and how to help improve this situation. This is a key component of that. Um, so again, we're really asking for parent cooperation. It, it is, it's an issue now with half the kids and it's only good, it was an issue before the pandemic. And um, when we get the traffic moving and we get people dropping off where that green bar is on this map, it's pretty smooth and, and um, and efficient. So we thank everybody for their support um, with that as we um, continue through uh, the rest of the year. This is a quick snapshot of the bell schedules. Obviously, each uh, every we have ten teams in the building. Each team, each, each two teams has a bell schedule. Um, but really, it, it kind of comes down to two bell schedules in the building at the same time that don't overlap. So um, six of our teams will be on the bell schedule to your left. Um, you know, who has first meal, second meal, third meal will change every few days, but, but they'll follow that model. And the other four teams will be in the model to your right, where they either have fourth or fifth meals um, each day. Um, you can see we have breakfast continuing with that um, throughout the day, as well as lunch. A big change is ASB. Currently, it's connected to period four. It will become connected to period three. Um, meals are still um, free uh, through the end of the year through a federal program. So we're not uh, charging um, anybody uh, for breakfast and lunch. It's reimbursed through a federal program. Um, so we're really excited to opt for that opportunity. Also, by maintaining the two meals in the school day, um, which we're able to do because we're only running six academic periods this year as opposed to seven, um, by, by doing that, we're also asking that we, we uh, other than for obviously students who, who need the accommodation for medical reasons that, that we we're not having a, a separate snack time, um, on the schedule with the two meals a day. Dismissal is pretty straightforward. Um, students exit the nearest exit and go around the outside of the building. That's not a change. Everybody's been doing it. Um, the bus loop is reserved for buses, but nobody's going to be getting in there because it's going to be filled with buses. Uh, I want to bring people's attention to the fact that there's going to be a second change in the traffic pattern. Um, we're anticipating Mansfield High School to return April 28th. So from April 5th, you'll see the first increase of traffic. And then April 28th, you're going to see probably a second little uh, uh, change or, or increase surge at that point, uh, just so people are aware of that. We are re resuming our after school activities in a limited capacity on April 27th. Um, this is to sync it up also with when the high school is coming back and getting the late buses online and all of that. Um, but I, I need to make sure that everybody understands the expectations with this. It's for extra help. There's no general holding place for people to be staying after school. Um, so if your child says something like, I'm gonna go hang out in the library or I'm gonna go hang out here, they're not. Um, and if we have students who don't have an assigned place to go after school, we're going to have to call. Um, and we don't want to be in that situation. Um, 
So after school and extra help, uh, after school extra help and activities can resume on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Uh, Mondays and Thursdays, the the high school is going to be using the buses more heavily. Uh, and additionally, that's when our teams are having their team meetings this year um, because we weren't able to have those during the school day as we would have normally. Um, students are expected to sign up a day in advance with their advisor if it's a club <laughs> or their teacher if it's an academic class. Nobody should be coming in the day being like, I'm going to stay after today. It, it's got to be something that's pre-planned. And part of that is the fact that our teachers need to make sure that there's six foot distancing after school. Um, because of the fact that there's contact tracing involved and also it's it's going to be a little bit um, mixing of, of some of our platoons and things like that. So um, so it's got to be a pre-planned thing. Clubs and activities um, may or may not be starting to run live, but we want to make sure that all of our clubs and activities remain inclusive for our remote students. Um, I think there's a good chance many of our clubs will stay remote for the rest of the year and return in person um, in the fall. We also, with this, have to make sure that people, um, that we have the information we need regarding the late bus. So just like if a student's gonna take the late bus, they gotta sign up for that the day before as well. Um, they can come see Ms. Back or Ms. Hazel in the main office, um, either during breakfast or lunch to sign up. Um, we have a, a, a system um, designed and in place to make sure students know which seat they have on the bus and uh, make sure that, that the buses aren't over capacity or anything like that. Um, so we are studying that after school activities, but they're, they're, it's not something we can just kind of live on a, a whim. Students have to, and parents and teachers, everybody's gonna have a plan uh, for how they're gonna utilize that time. Right now, I'd like to share our tentative plans uh, when or if students are quarantined. I'd also like to, before I go to that point, talk about the fact that we're also doing things to minimize the chance of students being quarantined. We can't eliminate it, but minimize it using our platooning, uh, making sure we're, we're trying to keep students with a smaller group throughout the day so that if we ever have an instance where somebody was in the building with COVID, um, that their exposure would be um, as minimal as possible. Um, a lot of our quarantines this year have actually been of students who are identified as close contacts out of school. Um, so, you know, somebody who is in uh, some sort of extracurricular like sport or thing like that where, um, where we've had to get to that point. So um, obviously we want to keep it at a minimum, but we're, we're ready and prepared if it happens. Um, so this is a tentative plan. We're still working on the 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 final um, the final finishing touches on it, but I do think that this is pretty representative, and I don't really foresee any drastic changes to it as we move forward. Once everything's 100% solidified, we'll share it out again. Um, but I did feel at this point, and and kind of touch base with other stakeholders that that it was at a point where we could start talking about it tonight. Um, it's going to be available to students who are in quarantine for COVID reasons. Um, the way you get referred to that is through our amazing school nurses, um, Ms. Anderson and Ms. Brown. Um, you know, if a child was exposed somewhere outside of school, call the nurse. If the child's symptomatic, let our nurses know. And um, then our nurses will be maintaining the list of people who would um, qualify for the quarantine learning plan and making sure that teachers have that. It's going to be more of an asynchronous learning model with a daily with daily connections with teachers. So uh, for students who are in quarantine, they'll connect with their teachers at the start of each class um, via a Google Meet um, at the assigned start time of the class following the normal bell schedule. Um, during that meeting, the teacher can check in with them, answer any questions they have from day to day, make sure they know what they're working on, take attendance, and they'll probably ask them for a deliverable to be due at the end of each period um, to the teacher. Um, we're going to put in place a helpline um, because what's going to happen is that that's going to allow the classroom. And again, um, with the systems we have in place, I don't see entire, I, I can't say it's not going to happen, but I don't necessarily see whole classes being in a scenario where they're put into quarantine. Um, we're going to have a helpline in place so that the teacher can then go back to delivering that in-person instruction um, in, in place for students to get support the rest of the class if they need it. And we'll have the information for them to contact Mr. Quinn. He's one of our permanent building subs. We'll be taking on this, this, this academic support role. He's done some work with this, um, with some of our other groups over the course of the year. 
Um, so we're, we think it's going to be a, a good resource for our students. Um, but I will say if we're, we get into this and we find out that Mr. Quinn's just kind of sitting around with nothing to do, uh, we may reevaluate it, um, especially with that daily connection with the teacher. Um, students in the quarantine will be marked in their attendance as virtually present. Okay. Um, but the one thing that, that we are moving past at this point is we've had a lot of like, I'm just going to log into class today kind of out of nowhere. And uh, for the most part, our teachers have been accommodating it. But whereas we're moving past live stream classes and committing ourselves to the full in-person delivery of instruction to our students, um, that's something that we're not going to have in place um, as we move forward through the school year um, in our in-person teams. So how do we go about ensuring success? Um, so for the students, we're asking them, they, we have not had mask issues whatsoever. Um, kudos to our student body for that. Um, they're very diligent about it. Um, it. It amazes me how many of them keep them on at times when they can actually have them off. Um, it's actually something I didn't really expect. We ask people to try to stay to the right in single file lines, bring what they need to school. Our teachers have communicated pretty clearly to students what they need to be carrying. We still can't give out lockers. Kids are still gonna have the bags. We're gonna have more kids in the building. Um, so really make sure that child, your child is only bringing to school what they need to bring to school. Because I do know that there seems to be a vast discrepancy oftentimes between what um, a child's carrying and what they're expected to have. And if you have questions about what they're expected to have, uh, or you think your child is carrying a, a bonkers amount of stuff around, I highly advise you connect with your team's liaison. We ask that you follow CDC guidelines outside of school um, to make sure that we keep our school a safe place and then asking our students to follow routines. From our parents and guardians, obviously check your continue to check your child for COVID-19 symptoms daily. Um, do not send your child to school with uh, COVID-19 symptoms. If you've uh, recently traveled, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, or if your child is identified as a close contact. A big thing, and I, and I do need to say this because um, our two nurses, Ms. Brown and Ms. Anderson, have really gone above and beyond in a lot of the work they've done, working incredibly long hours, um, texting me all weekend long because they're working on the contact tracing and all of that. Um, they're doing their job. They're doing a great uh, uh, um, a job. I'm really asking that people treat them with the respect and courtesy that they deserve. Um, I know it can be disconcerting if you hear your child needs to be put into quarantine. Um, but they're there for the health, safety, and well-being of all of our students. And, um, and I, I'm just asking that people please recognize that and treat them with the professionalism that they deserve. Um, respect those quarantine requirements. And, and remember, there is no student vaccine yet. That, that's not something that exists. Um, they're working on it, um, but that's not something that's here yet. There are things I want you to be aware of. Um, you know. Right now, um, we have not had to quarantine many students in school for uh, being around people with COVID-19. We've, we've had to, but we haven't had to do many. And part of that is as the year went on, early in the year, um, you had to quarantine people around or, or chunks of classes. Then as the guidance shifted, once we had six feet, which we had in a lot of places, you didn't have to do that. Um, now, all the studies have shown, and I feel confident that we're not going to see spread at three feet with all of our mitigating measures. But the CDC guidelines still say that we need to contact, uh, quarantine close contacts within six feet. So by simple definition that we had almost no opportunities where it could come up within the school building to now having it in every class, we're probably going to see more of that, but not. I don't think it's going to be a high amount, but, but I want to put that out there and be open and honest with our school community. And again, treat our, our nurses with the respect and professionalism they deserve. They don't want to be calling people to, to share this news with them either. Um, and just realize that over the course of the year, they've had to call a lot of people with that news. Um, and they're really here to just keep everybody safe and healthy. The next bullet I'm going to put out there, but I don't think it's going to be an issue because most people have already kind of have shared with us if they plan on changing from um, fully remote to in-person or in-person to fully remote. Um, so I, this, I, I don't think this is going to happen, but if there ever were a massive swing in students one way or the other, there's no way we could run it the way we have it structured right now. 
Um, and I just want to be open and honest about that, but it's not something I see as a, a problem. And I'm pretty confident that unless a child's changing models, they will have the same teachers on April 5th that they have on April 2nd. If they're changing models, going full remote, or coming full in person, then obviously there'll be a team change. Um, everything in this environment has a hard cap. We can't squeeze kids into um, classes or platoons that don't have the room, just like we can't squeeze kids on the buses that, that are capped out. Um, you know, some of these classrooms, and you know, when I started at Qualters, there were close to 1,300 students in the building. If everybody were in the building today, it'd be 800. I've seen rooms um, in that building holding up to 29, 30 people. You, you, you can fit them, but definitely not at three feet. Um, so everything has a, has a hard cap. Um, and I'm glad that we don't have classes that large anymore, but I've seen it, it's existed. Um, after April 5th, uh, we'll try to work as quick as we can, but be prepared for a change in model to possibly take up to four weeks. And again, part of that goes with how our staffing is aligned. Um, I'm very confident that everybody's keeping the same teacher again, unless they're changing models. Um, so yeah. The student travel advisory, um, actually this got uh, more updates uh, since I made the slide and I, I didn't catch updating it. So if you travel out of state for more than 24 hours, the travel advisory um, calls for people to quarantine for 10 days or test negative after 72 hours of arrival. Um, this is something that the schools um, need to still abide by. So I know um, it may not sound necessarily like that in the media, <laughs> um, but we've done our diligence working with all the health agents within the community of Mansfield, and um, and that is the case. So if any, it's not high risk states anymore because the state's no longer issuing the map. That's the change that kind of came out. Um, but if you travel out of state for more than 24 hours, um, there is an expectation that people follow the travel advisory, and we would have to. Um, you know, if we found out that a child was in school after traveling for a long weekend out of state or April vacation um, and hadn't gone through those steps. Um, if people test negative, please contact our nurses, get them the test results, and we'll make sure we work through that. Um, I put this in here too. A lot of people have asked me, like, will teachers all be vaccinated? And um, the answer is no. Um, a lot of teachers, a vast majority, um, have gotten their first shots. Um, a lot are getting them soon. Um, but even under the state's calendar, the, the fourth day for educators is after or the tail end of April vacation to get first shot. So um, although I think Mansfield may have, our teachers may have had a little bit more success in getting appointments, um, I, you know, people keep asking, so I'm sharing that, that fact, but I don't think that's gonna be um, in place. And I kind of picked May 1st as a date when I, when I shared that based on kind of informal data. So what are our next steps? Um, for people who are changing models, which is not many people, um, but if you're changing models, meaning you're going from in-person, remote, or you're going from remote, in-person, we're going to include team placement letters with report cards. Um, which should be mailed by March 30th, um, might be a little bit earlier. And if we can share that before then, we will, but but that's gonna be our, our, our um, kind of last, last minute if we have to get that out there. Obviously, if your child's going remote, you don't really need the letter because there's not many options. If they're in sixth grade, they'd be going to the Navy team. If they're in seventh or eighth grade, they'd be going to the red team. It's pretty straightforward. Um, but, um, we wanted to, to know that. And again, uh, school is five days a week, full days, starting April 5th. Um, no more asynchronous Wednesdays. Um, it is a full school day, five days a week for all of our teams. Um, Red Navy, continuing remote, all other teams in building. And you know, as we move forward, we really look for your cooperation and support implementing these protocols and getting our students back into the building and recommitting ourselves to what we know is the more successful learning environment. Um, so right now, um, if you don't have, if you have any last minute questions at things there, this is my last slide. This also runs on a delay. So I'm gonna start answering some questions soon. Um, any other questions, we'll send out an FAQ sheet tomorrow based on the questions that were submitted. And obviously um, somebody appropriate from the school, if there's a, you know, really a private student specific question that came up throughout the presentation, 
um, the appropriate personnel would be reaching out over the next few days. Um, so get those questions in while I kind of go over my upcoming events and, um, and we can um, start to talk about them. Um, incoming grade six parents. So I know that probably not many fifth grade parents here here, but you may know them. We're starting to publicize this, our sixth grade, uh, incoming sixth grade, so fifth grade <laughs> parent and guardian orientation is April 28th at 6.30 p.m. We're using the same venue. Um, so any, if you know any fifth grader families and you want to share that some more, I know Mr. Naraco is getting that information out over at JJ, would be greatly appreciated. And also for eighth graders, I wanted people to know, I know I've put in a newsletter, but we are planning an eighth grade promotion ceremony. Um, we're anticipating holding it outside in the QMS courtyard and to keep crowd sizes appropriate, we'll be holding it by team. Uh, green and red, since they're, they're split team, seventh and eight, we'll be able to combine. And also for students who are unable to come, um, given the pandemic or for any other reason, it's going to be broadcast um, by uh, Mansfield Cable Access. So super big thank you to them for agreeing to come out uh, for those four ceremonies. And if there's inclement weather on the 14th or 15th, we have a rain date on the 16th. And if there's inclement weather on both days, we'll have to figure that out when we get closer. So um, just to keep that, that on everybody's radar, because uh, we're pretty excited and we really want to give our our, uh, our eighth graders a proper send off because um, they've been a valuable part of our school community for the past um, three years. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and come back and start to look at some of the questions that we have here. Um, with the pick up and drop off, I'm seeing some questions here about congestion on East Street. Um, so we've, we've done this before, um, nothing dramatic changing at drop off. The buses have always filled the bus loop. Um, traffic is a little bit, um, a little bit thicker. Uh, right now we have a lot of downtime. Really once we get to about seven, eight, once the buses leave, it really seems like most people are in. Um, I think our students are gonna have plenty of time to get to class. It's never been an issue in the past with our whole school coming in. And again, I'm, I'm gonna kind of go back to when we had 1300 students. Um, as long as we keep East Street flowing the best we can, um, I, I'm confident that students will get there. But if we start seeing patterns early on, we'll hold attendance. But, um, but once people kind of get the timing of the traffic down, it's been successful and it's been successful with a lot more. Um, so I, I've seen some questions about the quarantine. So we talked about our asynchronous learning plan, um, but that includes a check-in with each teacher at the beginning of the period and access to Mr. Quinn to provide some academic support throughout uh, the day. Um, so we're gonna make sure that that curriculum and the work that the child is doing is timely and relevant and to keep them on pace with what's going on within uh, the classroom for when they return. Um, so. Um, and again, that meet will just be at the beginning of the class um, to touch base with the students. And again, I, I want to be clear, I'm not expecting wide numbers of um, quarantining to be happening across the board. I know it's going to happen, um, but even if you prorated right now in, um, in our building, it would be less than a kid per class, and that would not even, not even that point. So uh, we're going to keep up with that. Um, obviously revisit if it becomes problematic, but we do believe um, that through our mitigation measures and implementing that model with the teacher check-in at the start of class um, and the support that the students may need throughout the period, um, that, that, that we'll have some success there. Okay. Yeah. So in terms of, there's a question here about the breakfast and lunch schedule. So right now it's, it's, it's similar. So two, there's, right now we have three meals, first, second, and third. If you have first breakfast, you have first lunch. If you have second breakfast, you have second lunch. And uh, with the six day cycle we use, um, two days you'd have first, two days you'd have second, two days you would have third. That pattern basically will stay in place for six of our teams. Um, then the other four who will have the, the other bell schedule because the period stopped lining up will have either a fourth, um, 
fourth for um, three days and fifth for three days. So they'll continue to be a rotation with which student has. And all of your students will be getting updated schedules and teachers will be going over with them over it with them over the course of the next week. I also included the schedule with the teams and who has which meal and everything with the newsletter that had the link. Um, you had to scroll down a little bit, but there was a downloadable PDF of the schedule so you can see where that is and, and kind of where your child's team would fall. Um, yes, uh, the remote teams will be fully synchronous on Wednesdays. Um, the whole building is gonna be full five days now, um, okay. Virtually present for quarantine students does count towards the required number of school days. Um, and there's specific language in there about quarantining from the state. Um, so yes, it does count as, as a school day for, um, for students who are in quarantine. <laughs> Percent of the administration who's been vaccinated. So. I'm not 100% sure about everybody in the building, but I'll be honest, uh, Mr. Hoffman and Ms. Cotillo beat me to the uh, to the the jab, if you will. Um, I'm 50% there and they're complete. <laughs> so um, that, that's kind of where we stand if people are really interested. Um, I'd be happy to detail my my voyage down the Mass Pike to Springfield to get my first shot, um, but, but that's kind of where we stand right now. And I, I do think a lot of our faculty um, have gotten it, and a lot of our faculty have actually, through CBS, gotten access to the Johnson and Johnson shot, which has not required two trips. Um, but um, but but that's kind of where we are. Um, um, a lot of people have been asking about you know kind of uh, different terms for it, but the the term used by the state often is pool testing or kind of random testing, surveillance testing. They're, they're all kind of different names for it. Um, that is something that the district has done a lot of homework on, um, and it's it's a it's a very complicated um, subject that requires a lot of cons uh, getting consent from everybody who's participating and a lot of manpower to administer them. And we're not saying uh, you know it's been a it's also been talked about quite frequently at, at school committee meetings. Um, it's something that um, we're continuing to look into. Um, we also have the ability um, to work with the state if there were ever some sort of outbreak. Um, but it is a complex thing, and what's not heavily talked about is the needing of consent for every single person that's tested, and then um, a lot of the other pieces that go with it. Um, so we continue to look into that, but at this time, the district has not decided to go with the, the pool testing. Okay, so it looks like, um, well, also thank you to all the people who put in some kind words as well, um, thanking us for our hard work. Um, you know, it, it's been an, a, a roller coaster of a year. Um, I would not wanna go through it with any other community. Um, this has really been, uh, uh, I think, a, a great example of how um, the community of Mansfield can pull together. Um, I can't thank our teachers and faculty enough, and it's great to see our students every day. And I have been waiting for what's going to happen on April 5th since April of last year. Um, I really have. And that's what school is supposed to be. School is community. School is our kids together. Um, and I'm really, really excited for that day to come. So with that, I'm going to give the question um, one last um, scale or scroll down. It looks like we're good. So we will send out tomorrow, um, assuming I haven't been able to look at it. So assuming it's not too long. Um, We'll be sending out an FAQ document um, tomorrow or the next day with answers to questions. Um, and uh, we're looking forward to seeing everybody on April 5th. And uh, thank you for joining us this evening. Have a great night.